Well, we want to welcome everyone tonight to Delaware Christian Fellowship, and we are going to continue in our study of basic Bible fundamentals. And uh, we've had a little bit of a change of venue, and uh, there's some different things kind of going on at Gospel Lighthouse. I, I'll be taking over some different roles, and there's been some rearranging, but I've wanted to continue on in this particular series that we've gotten started. And we are on the fourth topic tonight, and that topic is sin. It is sin, and um, the doctrine of sin, and what the Bible has to say about it. And we've broken down this particular study into four sections, okay? So first of all, we're going to talk about the pattern of sin. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I want to use Cain and Abel as an illustration uh, in regards to that. And then next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about sin, the root and the fruit, okay? Uh, and we'll get to that then. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about the effects of sin, or that we would say in modern times, probably the impact of sin. And then finally, the universality of sin, or the fact that uh, all have sinned and that sin is universal. So let's get started tonight. I want to begin in the book of Genesis chapter 4, and I want to read the first seven verses. And of course, we know this is a familiar story of Cain and Abel. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel. Now that word respected in Hebrew gives the idea of he gazed upon. Uh, that is, he looked upon the offering, okay, um, with acceptance and with respect. And his, and his offering, and he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain, of course, we know, was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? You see that question. You see, God is no respecter of persons. Um, God didn't like Abel's sacrifice because he preferred Abel over Cain. I read one particular rabbi, or, or uh, I should say one commentator in this case, actually made the point that he believed that God accepted the offering of Abel because it smelled better than Cain's. Uh, I mean, these are the types of things that people think that are just wildly off base. But it didn't have anything to do with that, okay? Notice what he said again. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And when we talk about doing well, what we're really saying is, when we do what we know is God's will. You see, God has a will. He has a way. He has a pattern of doing things, okay? And when we follow his will, we will be accepted, okay? But when we do not, of course, if, and that's what God says here. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule, rule over it. So we see sin here being pictured almost like a viper that is just waiting to strike. And that is what uh, God is telling Cain. Now I just want to say some things tonight about Cain and Abel and maybe share some things that... Um, maybe you're not either familiar with or maybe you haven't um, thought of before. But first of all, of course, we know Cain was the oldest of two brothers, okay? He was the oldest of two brothers. And secondly, he's mentioned eight times in the Old Testament. And um, almost every one of those are right in the first four chapters of the book of Genesis. He's mentioned three times in the New Testament. 
and pretty much all of them are in a negative kind of way. Thirdly, Cain gave an offering from the tilled ground, and God did not, again, here's, here's our literal language, he did not gaze upon it, that is to say, he did not show interest or respect for the offering that Cain, uh, Cain brought. And then fourthly, he grew extremely angry, and then he killed his brother. And this is where I want to kind of emphasize some things tonight. Now, typically, when you talk about Cain and Abel, um, teachers or commentators will kind of go down the line. They will say, well, Cain was jealous of his brother Abel, so he rose up and killed him. Well, um, there's, only a, there's only a limited amount of evidence that it would even support that type of a notion. Uh, they almost try to project it like some kind of sibling rivalry. But if you take the fullness of all of the verses in the scriptures that deal with the topic of Cain and Abel, you'll find that it is much, much more serious than that. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Again, commentators typically assume that Cain killed his brother Abel because of jealousy, but the scripture reveals that there was a way about Cain, okay? You'll remember in Jude chapter 11, the scripture talks about people who have gone into sin. They are rebellious, and, the, and it says they have gone in the way of Cain, and they have ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, so on and so forth. He murdered because his own works were evil. Say, why did he kill him? First John 3 and 12 tells us, wherefore did he kill him? because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So there is your breakdown, okay? Cain wanted to do things his way. He wanted to do what was from the imagination and the thoughts of his own heart. Now keep in mind that Cain was the oldest. Um, Cain would have had access to every bit of information that Abel would have had. It wasn't as though these two brothers just decided one day well, we're just going to come up with some kind of offering that we're going to offer to the Lord. There was some kind of revelation that, that they were moving in, okay? There was information. If you go back and you look at the life of uh, Adam and how him and Eve had sinned, they had tried to sew fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. And of course, we know nakedness is sort of a picture of sin. And they tried to cover their sin with fig leaves, as it were, but the Lord slew, obviously, some animals, because if he gets some animal skins, animals can't survive without their skin. He, he ultimately had to have shown them the pattern of sacrifice, and that ultimately being that shed blood will be the only means of remission of sin. That is how God is going to cover our sinfulness, as it were. Okay, We will, we will need to have this shed blood of Christ applied to our conscience, applied to our lives, so that this sin can be dealt with. But we'll talk about that uh, in, in a later time. But I only brought that up to make this point, that God would have shown uh, Adam and Eve, through this illustration, giving them the, the skins, the pattern of blood sacrifice and the value of it and the importance of it. The thing about a sacrifice and a blood sacrifice is that it means the whole life has been poured out. Uh, there was a popular Christian song that sounded really good. It got a lot of people excited, and it talked about how one drop of blood was able to go to the scales and save people. Well, that's, that's great for a song, but it's not biblical because it's the complete pouring out of the life of Christ to the point of death that brings salvation. Mm -hmm. And it is the complete giving of ourselves to the Lord, okay? When we come to the Lord, um, Paul talked about being crucified with Christ. He said, uh, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. But, um, so the whole idea is the whole giving over of a person's life. Uh, the former has passed away, the new has come, it's like the old person is dead and now you're beginning to walk in the newness of life. So these are the pictures that we have, the whole pouring out of one's life. And this is the picture and in in what Abel brought, okay? 
He brought a picture of, of course, shed blood, the complete giving over of one's life. Okay, and all of these things, I'm convinced he did by revelation. You say, well, how could it have been by revelation? Well, the scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 that by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, okay? And the only way that we can move in faith is, is as the scripture tells us, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When we learn something about God, when he brings revelation to us, we respond to that, okay, and that is faith. Um, if we do things in our own mind, in our own heart, okay, this is not moving in faith. And Cain found this out the hard way because God did not accept his sacrifice. You say, what should he have done? Well, Cain being the oldest should have been the example. He should have been the one who was trying to figure out, okay, what is acceptable to the Lord? What is God revealed? What is God's will? And then move accordingly. But that isn't what he did. As a matter of fact, his sacrifice was not acceptable. Ultimately, again in 1 John 3, the Bible tells us that Cain was of that wicked one. Okay, and he slew his brother. Now, there are some other points that are very uh, vital that I want to talk about that help us to sort of understand. Keep in mind, our topic tonight is the pattern of sin. Now, this is going to be demonstrated all throughout history, starting with Cain and Abel, all the way through the time of uh, Israel as they uh, got away from God and God sent them prophets, all the way through the time of the beginning of the Gospels with John the Baptist, with the Lord Jesus, Paul the Apostle, people like Stephen and all of that, okay? What you're going to have is this basic thing. You're going to have people who are responding to what they know is God's will. They are trying to communicate the need to respond to do what God has said. In other words, do what God has said. And then you're going to have on the opposite side the Cain types who utterly are rejecting uh, the things that God is saying. Now, I said this in our lesson tonight, that people get angry when they're not accepted, okay? That is, when their idea, their contribution is rejected. But understand that when it comes to the things of God, we don't have the prerogative to innovate. Um, it is God that is dictating to us what he wants, what, how things should be, and not the other way around. And this is a hard thing to swallow in modern times. Um, think about how the wilderness tabernacle was set up, how every, practically every square inch of it was dictated by God. Think about how everything was so meticulously set forth in the Old Testament under the law and how the sacrifices were to be done. God literally wrote out every single step of how he wanted things to be done, okay? And when people tried to innovate, okay, for example, when you had the two brothers offering the strange or the common fire before the Lord, the fire came out and completely devoured them. Why? Because they were trying to do something that they wanted to do. They wanted to do something that was different than what God was saying, and God was saying that is completely unacceptable, okay? So you've always had this happening. People wanting to do uh, the service of God, wanting to come to God, wanting to build a tower to God, wanting to come up with their own way of salvation. In other words, all of these things that are in our own mind, okay, that God has rejected, okay? He's given us his pattern, and he's, uh, he's told us what to do. There's a scripture that says, there is a way that seems right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. That has always been true. That's the story of Cain and Abel, and that's the story even in modern times. But again, we want our ideas, we want our contributions to be welcome and embraced. We even want them to be celebrated. You know, we want a pat on the back. Well, that's a great idea, but the question is, when it comes to the things of God, okay, is it God's will? Is it what God wants, okay? Again, people get hostile. When a believer points out what is God, God's word is saying on a subject, um, the world doesn't want to hear it, especially in the matters of sexuality, 
uh, in identity. Uh, they want to try to innovate. Well, we've got some new thing. Well, there's no new thing under the sun. It's just an old dog with a new name. These are old, ancient sins, okay? No matter how they're trying to dress them up today. And God is rejecting these things, okay? So we can't move in what the Scripture calls self-will. In Titus 1, verse 7, the Bible tells us that leaders must not be self-willed, okay? You have to be focused on what is God's will. What does God want? What is God saying, okay? And when you veer off of that track, you start moving towards sin. One of the definitions of sin, and we're, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, that we'll talk about in weeks to come, is the idea of missing the mark, okay? To miss the mark. And it's the whole idea of, of introducing into God's creation all kinds of problems and things, okay? Because you're trying to do it your, your way. You'll remember old Blue Eyes uh, used to sing, I did it my way, and even Elvis took it up. And a lot of people like to play that at a funeral, but I've never really found it humorous uh, when people do it their way. Typically, when people do it their way, it's usually going to be a really difficult life. Again, not moving in self-will. Second Peter 2.10 talks about people being self-willed, okay? And it never speaks of that in a positive way. We are to seek out God's will and to know his counsel um, in everything that we do. That's how we avoid sin. Now, there's something about Abel that a lot of people are probably not aware of. Just simply maybe they read over these passages. But we learn from the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm going to contrast him with Abel who was self, I'm sorry, with Cain who was self-willed. We learn from the Lord Jesus that Abel was both righteous and by inference he was the first prophet. Now if you read Luke chapter 11 verse 49 to 51, Jesus is telling, he says, this generation is going to be judged in, in the blood of all the prophets from Abel until Zacharias is going to be required of this generation. So we infer from that Okay, and it's commonly accepted among your commentators who are critical uh, scholars that that's exactly what the Lord meant, is that he, in a sense, was the first prophet. So what could that possibly mean? Okay, how does that impact the way we view Abel? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing about a prophet is that a prophet spoke on behalf of God. That's one of the things they did. They spoke to enforce, to emphasize, and to plead with the people concerning God's will. Okay, that's what a prophet would do. They would try to get people on track. You're, you're away from God. You need to get back to the Lord. Um, maybe even in, in desperate times, they would say God's going to send judgment if you don't turn back. Okay, so this is what a prophet does. And I believe that's what Abel was doing. I don't have any doubt that Abel was probably telling his brother Cain. God may have even used Cain to speak to Abel, uh, or Abel rather to speak to Cain in this regard. Um, he may have used Abel to tell Cain, you know what, if, if you do well, you will be accepted just like I was. But if not, sin is crouching at the door. God could have used Cain, uh, Abel to say that to Cain. Because he was moving, obviously, according to Jesus, in a prophetic way. So, just as we see when the Lord Jesus tells us in John chapter 3, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. What is the response that we see from people who refuse to turn to God, they refuse to repent, what is their response? Historically, it has almost always been to try to destroy the messenger. You see that. You remember again, Matthew 23, 35, Luke 11, 49 to 51, Jesus said that the blood of all these prophets was going to be required of that generation. And what had happened? God had sent these people. He had tried to keep people on track. Okay, he used Abel and the life of Cain to keep him on track and rather than listen he killed his brother 
okay? What happened later? You had other prophets who came along. Fast forward to the New Testament. Think about all the prophets who were persecuted. Think about all the prophets who were killed. Think about the radical things that they would try to do to get the people back on track. I think about Ezekiel at one point. He had mixed up some bread dough and, and, and used some cow dung, pardon the expression, mixed it up and cooked some cakes from it. Just radical stuff to try to get the people's attention because they were so hardened in their sin. And I'm afraid that's where people are today. I really wonder what it's going to take to get people's attention today. What is it going to take? I mean, what is it going to take for people to turn to the Lord and give Him their undivided attention so that He can begin to speak to them and get them on track? It's like people are just like a runaway train with no brakes. They're just going away from God. Secondly, Abel was the first person we have record of who was justified by faith. Okay? He... Abraham, uh, uh, Abel was the first person that the scripture said offered unto God a better sacrifice than Cain. He did it through faith, and the scripture said God testified of, the, of his righteousness and him being dead, yet spoke. Okay, he's listed among the faithful in the book of Hebrews. He was justified by faith. Why? Because when he knew what God's will was, okay, when he had revelation of that truth, he responded rightly to it. He didn't decide, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do my own thing. I've got a better idea. Okay, he didn't do any of that. He wanted to know what is God's will. That's what I want to do. What has God said? What is the full counsel of God on this subject that I can walk in it? You'll remember that when Jesus was being tested of the devil, that one of the things the devil tried to get the Lord to do was he said, if you are the son of God, make these stones into bread. And of course, to us, that, you know, that's simple enough. Surely there wouldn't have been sin in that. But the Lord Jesus was so sensitive to the fact that he wanted to be doing exactly what his father's will was. He wouldn't even convert stones into bread, okay, uh, after not having eaten for 40 days. And what did he say? He quoted from Deuteronomy. He said, And man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding from the mouth of God. That's how Abel, I believe, wanted to live. He didn't have a Bible. He didn't have revelation, okay, like we have today. But what little bit he knew, he responded rightly to it, and God put him in the book of Hebrews, and he called him a prophet in Luke 11, 49 to 51. This meant his life or his words or both were revelations of God's will and his character, okay? Again, Abel was the first person that we have on record that was justified by faith. He was the first person to die. He was the first person mur murdered. He was the first person martyred, okay? And I suggest to you he was martyred for the testimony of the truth of God's word, and it was his own brother who rose up and killed him. He was the first of a long line of prophets, including John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, Stephen, and others, who died because they spoke God's truth. See, it's never been popular to stand for truth. It's never been popular to emphasize God's will or try to get people, even your own family, to do the right thing. And Abel paid with his life. Abel was both righteous and his works were righteous, righteousness rather. This can only be true if what he did, the way he walked, the words he spoke were in agreement with God's revealed word. Okay, that's the key. Amos 3 verse 3, can any two walk together except they be in agreement? That's the thing God wants to do. He wants to get people, first of all, in agreement with him. We can't be in disagreement with God. When God says something about sin, we need to say amen. Mm -hmm. See, when we begin to kick back and we begin to say, I don't believe that sin, I don't believe that, you know, this is the modern day, we've got a new way of doing things. Listen, there is no new thing under the sun. Sin is as old as, as 
the Garden of Eden and even all the way back into eternity when Lucifer fell. We can dress it up, like I said earlier, the way we want, but the fact of the matter is sin is sin and it will always be sin. Inasmuch as Abel knew his master's will, he walked in it by faith. When he was killed, his blood cried from the ground. That was the blood Jesus said. This blood's going to be required of... So apparently all of the blood of the prophets had cried unto God from the ground, and he ultimately did bring, bring revenge. Pro presumably, when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, that was such a horrific event. Jesus said that God required his blood of the, of the generation who rejected the Lord, presumably, again, those who were involved with the um, rejection of Christ uh, that were around during the time of the temple. Many more things I'd like to say, but I'm just about out of time tonight. I have four things that I just pretty much suggest to you tonight are the pattern of sin, okay? First of all, there's rebellion. You rebel against what you know is God's will. It's not that you're just rebelling against God's word. You are rebelling against God himself when you rebel against his word. Mm -hmm. The second thing is rejection, okay? When you try to offer something, or, your, or your, whether it be your life or some kind of offering, you're trying to do something from your own self-will, you're trying to do it your way, that will always end in rejection or it will end up in some kind of catastrophe. You'll remember the story of Abraham. God gave him a promise, and he told him that in your old age you're going to have a son. But according to Habakkuk 2, verse 4, when the, when the, when the word that God gives tarries, we need to wait for it because it will come because the just live by faith. But what happened in that case was that Abraham, listening to the words of his wife, took Hagar, okay? He listened to another piece of revelation rather than God's revelation, and things really got messed up. Of course, as we know, uh, a child was born Ishmael. You look over in the book of um, Galatians, and Ishmael is a child of the flesh. So when you're moving in a revelation, whether it's your idea, whether it's someone else's idea, anyone else's idea except God's idea, you are moving in the flesh. Right. You are not moving in the spirit. Thirdly, retaliation. That's what happens. When people are rejected, when the Pharisees heard the denunciatory words of the Lord Jesus, they wanted to retaliate. When Cain saw that his offering was rejected, he wanted to retaliate. See, this is the attitude. But it, again, it's the progression. It is the pattern of sin. And then finally, removal. For Cain, he was, he was cast out. He lived a vagabond in the earth. For the Pharisees, they had basically uh, given up their opportunity to be have their place in what God was doing, so on and so forth, so they were removed. The solution, repentance. Repentance is a Greek word, two Greek words. One means to change your mind, and the other one means to turn or return. So we change our mind, metanoia, that means we change our mind to come into agreement with what God has said. And then finally, we turn. In other words, our actions begin to follow what our mind knows is the right thing. God deals with us in many ways about our sin, about the way our life is going. He has already created, we're, we're going to talk about it, or he has made provision, I should say, for all of our sins. He's made provision to take care of the sin problem in our life. He can deliver us and all of these different things, but we must respond to him, okay, when he deals with us. So there's good news tonight. You may be living in sin. You may be away from the Lord. You may be able to relate to most or many of the things that I've talked about tonight, but I've got good news for you. The Lord still loves you. And while there's breath in your, your lungs tonight, there's hope for you. If you just turn to the Lord with all of your heart, forsake your sin, turn to him, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Repent of all of your sins. Confess them. Don't make excuses. Don't blame someone else. But turn your life over to the Lord. Before you pillow your head tonight, it is my prayer that your heart will be made right with the Lord. And I just want to pray tonight as we're closing. 
Heavenly Father, we're just grateful tonight to be able to gather together once once again here at Delaware Fellowship, Lord. Lord, we've just come here tonight, Lord, to, to be able to fellowship with you and to learn about you, to learn about your word. And Lord, it's my prayer tonight that if there's anyone who's listening to this message tonight that has never turned to trust you, that before tonight, that they would just kneel down beside their bed, by their couch, or wherever they are, if their car, if they're driving in their car, Lord, that they would just turn to you with all their heart. Ask to forgive them, you, you to forgive them of all of their sins. And Lord, let this be the first day of the rest of their life. And Lord, let them go forward in the free pardon of sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and thank you for tuning in tonight.